Good evening, Pastor Mike here and from Toledo First Baptist Church. You know, Pastor Danny talked about joy last Sunday, so I thought I'd give you a little bit of joy this Wednesday night. Can't beat my fancy Christmas coat. The hat may be a little much, so I'm gonna take that off. Anyway, joy. You know, when, when I think about joy, there is no greater joy in my heart than to see God transform a life. And the person that's gonna share with you tonight, I remember, I met, I met her a long time ago when I was asked to coach soccer, even though I didn't know anything about soccer. Uh, Tara helped me know how to coach soccer a little bit, okay? And so, as many years after that, Tara started coming to TFBC. But when Tara first came, she brought her girls because she really thought her girls needed to be in Sunday school. And so Tara would bring them, and then Tara would sit in the hallway all by herself, just sitting there until they were done. Well, eventually, even during that time, God began working in Tara's life. And she came into worship one time. And so Tara's going to tell a lit some about her story. And it's all focused on love because that's what I'm preaching on this Sunday, the candle of love. So listen to Tara as she shares her story. Okay. Hi, my name is Tara Cooper and I'm a member here at Toledo First Baptist Church, and I was asked to come and maybe share a story about love. Um, it goes along with the series uh, leading up to Christmas, and so here we go. Um, I looked up a few things about love um, that I know I've heard our pastors talk about before, just to refresh myself, and, and I tried to kind of make them work with my story. So just as a reminder, there are lots of types of love and even under those types, there's a whole umbrella under each one. So of the eight types of love today, my story talks about agape love. And really the first time I ever heard that word was when Pastor Joe was preaching. Um, but I wrote down what agape love is and it's a selfless love. It's supposed to be unconditional. It's a universal loving kindness. Agape is what some call a spiritual love. It is bigger than ourselves, a boundless compassion, and infinite empathy. And empathy is pretty tough. It is the purest form of love that is free from desires and expectation and loves regardless of the flaws and shortcomings of others. And loving somebody despite all their flaws is, it, you know, it can be rough. Um, so today, my story is about an agape love. So of all the love languages, um, I don't know if you've taken the online quiz, but there's this online quiz you can take to learn your love language. And there's five main ones, and I'm not here to sell it, but I would encourage you, if you haven't done it before, to go on there to find out what the people around you use love languages. Not necessarily for yourself, but so that you can see how other people interpret love. Now, the quiz didn't work for me. Um, it never has because whenever I take it, I score darn even in every category. Um, but it's a super big bonus for me because it means I feel love no matter what. Like anything anybody does, I'm like, oh. Um, anyways, those are quality time, acts of service, receiving gifts, physical touch, and words of affirmation. And it's important to know your own language, but it's super duper important to know the language of the people that are in your life because they may interpret things a lot differently than you do. And it kind of goes along with the story I'm going to get to. So the first Bible verse I'll read is uh, one that's pretty well known. It's uh, Galatians chapter 5, uh, 22 and 23. And I brought my youngest daughter's Bible because it has big print and simple, simple words that don't confuse me so much. So it says, 
but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And there's a bunch of stuff before and after, but love is in there. And they put it first. So I'm guessing it's, it's, you know, it's a pretty important fruit for you to have grow on your tree. Um, I try to grow it. I don't know if I'm very good at it, but I know the people that have been in my life are very good at it. So more simply, Mr. Webster on the internet says the love definition can be a noun or a verb. So I like the verb part better than the noun, but noun, affection, attachment, devotion, fondness, and passion. But a verb where you're actually doing something is to appreciate, to cherish, to prize, to treasure, to value. And this is what I feel like when I read in the Bible or I hear things I'm hearing about the verb version of the word love. So, as I said before, I was asked to come and share a story. So here I am. Uh, fortunately, or unfortunately, for those that are listening, I'm still very, very close to a big event that happened in my life. And so everything, whenever anybody asks me a question, I always come back to this whole, the big C, cancer thing. And, you know, I have babies and I've had a whole life before and I'm working on my life after, but the biggest feelings I've ever had are revolving, you know, around that. And perhaps I'll grow out of it at some point, but not today. So, um, with that, I have to tell you all, I am super duper fortunate and blessed. Um, the people in my life are awesome and loving. Uh, I have two parents that are both living and they've always been good to me in my life, uh, before cancer, after cancer. But it wasn't until cancer that I really was like, wow, my parents think I'm awesome, they love me. Um, I have three healthy daughters. I mean, that's super great. I have a loving marriage. I have friendships and a stellar support system and I feel like I have a pretty good self-esteem. So I feel like I'm kind of like this love bubble, um, but that's okay, and I think it's good. Um, but with all of those experiences and all those loving people, um, what I can think of sharing with my church family is about the agape love that I felt during my treatment. and. My treatment wasn't just like a week, it's, it's been five plus years and it's still happening. So there's a reason that it's kind of taken a big chunk of my, my thinking and, my, and my, my memory bank. So it's pretty weird to know that I felt love from strangers, people that I will never ever know, as well as all those people that are really ingrained in my life. So what I mean is, even even though I work on those relationships, there's a bunch of random people that love me that I don't clue, and and that's pretty awesome. Um, but that is where my story story will start. Um, and I wanted to add, it's a good thing I took notes. Um, that this is also a time in my life that I have never ever felt closer to the Lord. Um, and I think that's something you have to feel to understand. But for those who have, it's awesome. And for those that haven't, just wait, it'll be great. So there's another Bible verse to read to start my story. And it is from the book of Isaiah. Um, I don't know what chapter this is. Oh, 54 verse 10. And it says, though the mountains move and the hills shake, my love will not be removed from you and my covenant of peace will not be shaken, says the compassionate Lord. Gee, I needed that at the beginning. Um, so I was 36 years old when I was diagnosed, very low survivability. And what I thought was the worst case scenario just really wasn't. Um, even though it was an awful beginning. 
I have to say I've never, I can say it without hesitation, never been so loved. I never felt so much love. And that's where we go. So for my family, my family really rallied around me. Um, they stepped in, helped with chores, cooking, cleaning, taking care of my kids. I had a teenager and a toddler. Um, they did the grocery shopping, they scrapped toilets, and they did all kinds of crazy stuff and I never asked. Um, they helped me homeschool and this was pre-COVID, so they were not in support of homeschool. They, they didn't homeschool. They're like, are you sure you want to homeschool? But you know, they never gave me a hard time once this all popped up. I mean, they were just there. And my parents had been divorced for 42 years. They separated when I was born and they were like a well-oiled machine. I'd never had my parents in the same house before and yet they were both there and they were just loving me and loving my family. And, and I knew it and I, I loved it. Um, my husband, my husband is like a rock star. He's pretty incredible, but even though he was working full time and had all these random people in his house helping and people showing up with food and, and whatnot, um, he picked up all the slack and he didn't bat an eye. If he was tired, I didn't know it. Um, <laughs> I was bald undernourished, underweight, grouchy. I was in an insomniac because the drugs make you woohoo. I could smell the people that walked through the door and it would nauseate me. And they, they were clean people. It just, chemo does this thing to your head and your brain where, where you're just Ugh. and And he tolerated me and he didn't even act like he minded. And that's a lot of love. I mean, it's, it, it, when you can love people when they're hard to love, uh, you just do it, I guess. I don't know how. I don't know if there's a recipe. Um, he just kind of rolled with it all unconditionally. He would watch movies with me, and I knew he'd rather be fishing. But he would stay home because there was no way I could go fishing. And I would have my every now and then temper tantrum pity party because, you know, we all do that. And he would just hold me. It's okay. <laughs> you know, and then it would pass. But, you know, he loved me and he loves me. And I think that's very special. And at the time I worked at the hospital, I had this work family and they were very involved. Uh, I think they took my diagnosis uh, well, they felt it too. And sometimes nurses and healthcare people, we kind of develop this really unique bond. And I'm sure it happens in other um, jobs too. But when you work so close to people and whatnot, you just get really close. They did a leave donation and they donated over 600 hours of leave to me. And I never asked. In fact, I had to put a cap on it and say, that's enough because that's like way more than I need. And in fact, it was. It actually got me through my reoccurrence of cancer with a new round of surgery and treatments. And I had enough leave to get me through all of it. Uh, they did fundraisers that paid my first two years of deductibles, which I have a high deductible plan. So that's a pretty big deal. So even though I was taking a hit I had so much support and love around me that it, it made it tolerable, I guess. Um, it says the outpouring of love and attention cannot be measured. So eventually I couldn't do floor nursing anymore because I was sick, but they wanted to keep me around, which is very loving to let somebody know that they're wanted and needed. So they found a position for me as a nurse, leader oh i did nurse leader rounds bald undernourished and i would walk into each patient room and ask them about their experience and try to check the boxes for medicare and and whatnot but in that time i was able to really connect with patients and it's amazing how they'll open up to you when you come in as a vulnerable person versus an employee and they loved me and i loved them and they would even let me pray with them sometimes, and I miss that. But eventually, I decided to take a few years off, and that's a good thing too. 
Um, but knowing all of my baggage and my injuries and whatnot, they still have a place for me there when I'm ready. And knowing that you're wanted is, like I said before, it's incredibly loving. So, last but not least is my church family. You folks. Um, I was still young at this church when this all started. Um, I'd been coming here a couple of years, but uh, I was in the background. Um, the day before my very first surgery, we were at a, a soccer thing that the Van Vlecks were doing uh, up at the high school and Pastor Mike was there. And I was sort of, I think I was in denial. Uh, but Pastor Mike knew that this was all going down and uh, he kind of came over to me unexpectedly and he actually put his hands on me, which if anybody knows me, I'm not a very touchy person. But it was, it, that's not the point. The point is, is he said this wonderful prayer, completely out of the blue and unexpected, and it was exactly what I needed. It was very, very loving. I was terrified to go um, be a patient instead of a nurse. Uh, but I'm here. <laughs> um, but that made me stronger. No one had ever done that before for me. Um, then when I was baptized as an adult, uh, my believer's baptism, Pastor Joe showed me incredible kindness. Uh, my work family actually came here and I had all three families kind of merge for a day and it was, it was pretty awesome. They all loved me freely and openly. Um, I had people that weren't necessarily big Christians or Christians at all, but they were here to support me and love me and be like, root me on. And that was great. I was bald. I was a little afraid of the water, but it worked. Um, I even made some new friends here, um, which for a while I had decided not to make any new friends because I didn't want to like croak or die and like leave people sad. So I decided it was better just to like kind of isolate. But you folks made it impossible to not reciprocate friendship and love. And I'm trying not to shed a tear here. <clears throat> that was pretty awesome. Um, our church helped me relearn to feel worthy of friendship. Um, made me feel worthy of gifts. Um, taught me how to receive. Um, was not very good at receiving compliments or prayers or gifts, friendships. And that love has made my life a lot better. So, I'm almost done. Back to the Bible. This is going to be 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I even numbered them here. I have on sticky notes. Oh, this is kind of a long one, but it's familiar. If I speak human or angelic languages, but do not have love, I am sounding, oh wait, I am a sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can move mountains, but I do not have love, I have nothing. And if I donate all my goods to feed the poor, and I give my body in order to boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, and love is kind. Love does not envy. It is not boastful. It is not conceited. Does not act improperly. Is not selfish. Is not provoked. And does not keep a record of wrongs. We've all heard it, but I got to feel it. So, although cancer is not ideal, uh, having the unknown ravage my once fit mind and body, I'm actually pretty grateful for it. Um, I appreciate life in ways I don't think I ever would have grown to. I feel love from so many angles I never would have been open to. My family and husband and my friends and brothers and sisters in Christ have all given me so much love that I have felt deeply. Um, the last verse that I have chosen
is from First John. And it is, Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. That one who does not love does not know God because God is love. And if you wanted to finish reading that passage, 7 through 20, it's, it's a good one. So, remember to be loved. You have to learn to accept it. People can love you all they want, but if you don't learn to accept it, it, it won't sink in. Merry, Merry Christmas. And thank you. Thank you, Tara. You know, Tara's story is, is because of love. Because our body loved her. Our church family loved her. And as she grew in the Lord and gave her life to the Lord, you know what? Now she is loving her church family. I see Tara connecting with people and loving people. And that's what it's all about. You know, the greatest commandments, Jesus says, first of all, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second commandment is to love each other as he has loved us. And so that's what it's all about. And isn't that what Christmas is all about? Loving God with everything that we are. And then loving other people. And what better time at Christmas than to love other people? So remember, we have three services on Sunday morning. We have the first service is eight o'clock, which is indoor. We have an outdoor on the lower patio at 930. And then we have a third service at 11. And at our 11 o'clock service, parents, we have classes for your kids. And so maybe parents, you haven't taken that step yet. Take that step and bring your kids and let them come to Sunday school. And hey, this Sunday, we also have our Christmas party for kids from 12 to noon, noon, pizza, or noon to two. Pizza, games, a craft, and a birthday cake for Jesus. So come and be part of that. And don't forget our Christmas Eve service. We're having two of them, an outdoor one at six o'clock on the lower patio and one at 7.30 inside the sanctuary. That's a candlelight service and it's always a special time when we can be together as God's family. So glad you're tuning in tonight. We pray that you will have a joyous week and it will be filled with love. See you Sunday.